I did. Okay. All right. Now we have all, all the tech stuff, I guess, happening. Um, okay. Um, so what we what we did in the past was um, um, have Dr. Poling um, talk about uh, um, oh, it's specific very, very specific diseases you need right, to break. Right, right, right. So, um, so we could do that um, for starters. Hello, everybody else. Um, and um, well, the, the, those that have greyhounds. Uh, what would you like to talk about? Right, Problems right. your animals have had. Right. Um, yeah, one of, one of the, the best outcomes from the last Zoom meeting we had was when you talked to um, the person who had Bonnie, who um, the, her, the vet she was seeing said that Bonnie had cancer, but then she sent the x-rays to you and it turned out that it was an old injury she didn't have cancer at all well so, it, but i looked at the original x-rays and i thought just like the local veterinarian did that dog very likely has cancer now how would we actually mm -hmm. determine that we would biopsy it mm -hmm. and what we're looking for on the x-ray is what's described as a lytic lesion there's less bone in cancer than there would be in infection inflammation or injury so it was a lytic bone, and we would normally say three, four, five months, the leg's going to break, and we either amputate it or put the dog down. Except the dog lived nine, 10, 11 months. And when we saw the second x rays, everything had changed dramatically. It was no longer a lytic lesion, it was a proliferative lesion. In other words, more bone being added. So the assumption is that's, that, that was an injury that really mimicked cancer. I also told a story about a golden retriever that we had a definite diagnosis of osteosarcoma, both by x-ray and biopsy. The dog survived and a year later, we could not find a lesion in the bone. Wow. And uh, we were kind of on the line for it because the client said, you guys screwed up. So I called my pathologist. They spent about a month doing research on it and they documented seven dogs that had diagnosed histiologic osteosarcoma and recovered, which wow. goes to show the body's dynamic. And e even a medical diagnosis may not be as definitive as you think. Which in this so, case turned out to be a good thing. Yes, yes. but yes. in 99 and plus percent, uh, what we diagnose unfortunately comes true and the legs break in three to four months. Right. So you're certainly right. gonna take a look at a dog that didn't follow the rules. Right, 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 right. God. Um, well, well, why don't we hear from somebody else? And I think that it does make sense to do the, uh, what would you all like to talk about, um, about your dogs? I mean, I've got a couple of things I'm thinking about, but Stephanie wants to talk. Go ahead. I have something to talk about um, that I want to ask uh, about uh, my dog, Sophie. Dr. Poling, you were uh, Sophie's vet until you retired, and we have missed you greatly ever since. He's not um, retired, though. You know, he has a practice yeah. in Austin. Too. Oh, are you still practicing? Yes. Well, I, I opened a new practice yeah. here in Austin. Yeah. Oh, you live in Austin. I got to move now. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually from Texas, believe it or not. So, um, wow. Uh, anyway, Sophie is now uh, 10 and a half. And um, she has some gum issues oh. now. Um, when she was seeing you, you know, you, you would remark about how her teeth were really good for a greyhound anyway. And um, she, so she had some teeth pulled in March and what the vet did, because um, I was concerned about putting her under, um, was that he just did a local and a nerve block. Mm -hmm. And some of her teeth were loose. So he just, he pulled her, um, where the incisors, the front teeth right. and a couple of molars. And she, I was, it was an hour in and out. Um, she came home, she bled pretty, pretty significantly for about 18 hours and was completely knocked out wow. for about a day and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so now she has another on the other side um, molars that are loose. In fact, one looks like it's just decayed. It looks like it's got a hole in it. 
And this time he seems to want to put her um, under, uh, deep under and do x-rays. But my issue is, and, and you diagnosed this with her, Sophie has a history of mini strokes and she's on a half a baby aspirin a day, which has prevented any additional strokes. Um, but the fact that she bled so much from that, that relatively, you know, minor um, procedure, huh? Minor procedure, minor procedure. And the fact that the anesthesia, which was a, a, a local and she was only under half an hour stayed in her system. Literally. I mean, it was like four or five days before she was herself again. Okay. I'm really nervous. Well, you should be. And now that she's 10 and a half. Yeah. Well, because a dog that was also Dr. Pauline's uh, patient for ages was a dog named uh, Ranny, and she actually bled to death um, after having one tooth out. Right. Uh, and, and she, you know, so was, was, was that before amino caproic acid? Uh, well, I don't know. Is, I don't know if you see her, but that's her. Yeah. Oh, so so busy, huh? we, we talked about this last time. It's greyhounds, probably 35% of them have a clotting abnormality that's been described, uh, but there, we don't really know what causes it. And all the bleeding tests that are done, the traditional clotting profiles, show that they're perfectly normal. You need but what Stop. they do, they do not form a normal clot. So it, 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 it'll clot, but in 15 or 20 minutes, uh, it breaks loose and continues yeah. to seep and weep, uh, even to the point of, uh, of death. Dr. Kuto told a story about a dog that got a microchip. So we're talking a minimal piece of, of silicon injected under the skin. And with that injection alone, had three units of blood that night in an emergency center. Wow. But amino caproic acid, uh, 500 milligrams uh, for a dog under 60 pounds and twice that will stop that. And it's very well documented. A greyhound should not have the, even the most minimal procedure without amino caproic acid the day of the procedure and five subsequent days. Because okay. she, she did not she did not have that and she and the way when I left they were telling me basically that she would you know she had stitches would be yeah. for a couple of hours and right. I'm I'm calling them like four or five hours later I'm like I'm, I'm finding small pools of blood yeah that, that are just she's just you know by, by her because she's knocked out and just leaning her head over the side of the bed and there's just like quarter size pools or more of blood and i'm like going it's not stopping yeah <laughs> you know? no and, that's really dangerous and you, you can look the amino caproic acid up it's readily available through veterinary suppliers and and any veterinarian that's doing greyhound work really should know about that because it's 36 percent of them and can you imagine if you did a major surgery mm. a, a leg amputation they would die they would die well, that's that my that's my concern in the fact that she has to be on the baby. I I don't dare not give her the baby aspirin, because I wouldn't want her to stroke while yeah. she's having a procedure done. And but, I know the aspirin should probably exacerbate all of that bleeding. Well, it it will a little bit, but I think where she's been on it consistently, uh, yeah. five days in advance, I would discontinue the aspirin and feel very comfortable with it, and okay. then four or five days after the procedure, I'd restart it highly unlikely she would have a stroke, especially okay. where she's been on that long. The, so the, the other thing is all that local anesthetic, it, where does it go? It's absorbed into the body. Yeah. And I, I've certainly had anesthetic and felt dizzy for three or four hours after and it was local only. So the, the, the advantage of the more, uh, what you might consider invasive protocols, uh, they're usually managed, we describe it as balanced anesthesia. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. So we're not using much of any one drug, but the majority of it after the induction is gas. You breathe it in, you breathe it out. And if that's managed properly, that dog is wiggling its ears and opening its eyes when we put the last stitch in. And th th they'll be on their feet in 10 to 12 minutes. Now, sure. that, that's, that's assuming they're using gases like sevoflurane, which are very quickly absorbed, very quickly eliminated. 
Well, yeah, I, I have to say, I'm just, I'm, I have to say, I'm just really anxious about it. Because yeah, oh, and I can see it. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, it's that amino proic acid, I think, is the miracle here. Now, the other thing, do a blood chemistry and a blood count prior to the anesthesia, because these drugs are metabolized in the liver and excreted in the kidney. An old dog that has normal kidneys and normal liver should not be much of a risk. And I say much of a risk, 5% of 1% should be the, the numbers for an anesthetic complication. So that's mm -hmm. one in 15,000. And that, that's saying that we had to make some adjustment with our anesthetic protocol, turn the anesthetic down, increase fluids to manage blood pressure, use a drug that uh, will speed the heart up. So it, it's not that those are even catastrophic situations, but they had to be attended to in a atypical way. If uh, can, you whatever, put that, can you put that drug in the chat so I so I can copy that? Yes, the, it's the, it's amino caproic acid. How do you spell it? Oh, geez, now you're really getting me here. A m i n o c a p r o p h i c acid. Steph, do you think that your event would be? Amenable to have it to like calling Dr. Pauling and talking about this? Well, um, even better, even better. Uh, the Greyhound Initiative that uh, Dr. Uh, Kudo has on the internet has every article written about Greyhounds. It's mm -hmm. a tremendous resource. Many of those, he's not even published them, but they're there. And oh. it has, it, it has both the syndrome you're talking about where your dog has strokes that we use aspirin for and the amino caproic acid, which is the exact opposite problem. So that there's something about the clotting elements of greyhounds that we don't understand. And, and the problem with them, it's such a small subset of the animals we see, uh, no one's committed the, the time and the money to really work it out. But we have a, we have a solution, just need to be aware of it. So yeah. it's, called, it's called the Greyhound Initiative. Is that yeah? Right. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I I'm familiar with that actually. Um, I my the vet that I that sees him sees her now um, has worked with greyhounds in rescue, which made me kind of surprised. Of yeah. The, kind yeah. of the way it did. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about it some more and uh, right. figure out what else what else what else we can do. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's really helpful that you're taking the precautions that you are because the dog I was mentioning, Franny, she bled out at night. I mean, that her 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 mouth just exploded and she bled all over the house and she died. Um, it was horrendous. Um, and so, 25 years ago, we would see those dogs and we would have a clotting profile and a blood count and a chemistry. And it's like, what the hell is happening to this dog? Well, that's how that's how we learned over the years. So well, well, that's it, exactly right. It, yeah. it, that's said, something's not heart, right about some of these heart. dogs. Yeah, but you saw like dozens and dozens. I mean, we started at the Brookline Animal Hospital in yeah. what 1984 or five, um, and you know that we learned pretty quickly all of these sort of different things. And you put yeah. them into practice and codified them, and um, so I think it's really important to keep you um, keep your keep your talking. Rod, um, yeah. because you, you've got a, you're a sort of an encyclopedia. Um, so uh, what's our next question from anybody? Wait, you wanna say something, Jane? She, she, oh, she's, you're muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself. Kathy, I think you're muted too. Kathy, I don't see Kathy. There we go. There you go. Okay. What if the fact that a dog's teeth, there she's not losing them or they're not loose or anything, and she's eating normal. At what age do you think you should stop putting them underneath anesthetic to just do a routine cleaning? Well, I think let's go back to the way we learned. We learned that we don't touch the teeth until they're so bad that they almost have to be extracted. And now that we have veterinary board certified dentists, 
they're saying, and, and, and many practices are advocating yearly cleaning or bi-yearly cleaning. Now, what I don't like about that is the cost and the risk. And I don't care if it's, if it's 5% or 1%, it's risk. And we don't have that risk with our own bodies because they're not anesthetizing very many of us anyway to do dental work. But dental work is the biggest cause of cardiac disease. And greyhounds are famous not for having it, but they're also famous for having terrible teeth. And what we used to say when the tooth was infected and you could smell it and the gum was retracted and it was red, oh, that bacteria is probably getting into the bloodstream, damaging the heart valve. And now the thought process, it's actually an immune response to a trapped infection. And it is life extending. It also damages the kidneys. And greyhounds can have protein losing nephropathies related to that. So I, I think you have to look at it is that infection is not making that dog feel well and has great potential to damage the kidneys and the heart valves. Yes, there's anesthetic risk, but, but as a veterinarian, I feel more comfortable cleaning them than dealing with the potential long-term infections. And, and those teeth look painful. They'll bleed when you touch them around the gum areas. That can't be comfortable. What about what about anti uh, giving them antibiotic? Because I know when I took Sophie in for this more recent um, uh, problem, they gave uh, because he, he I couldn't get here scheduled until the end of August. Yeah. Um, so he gave her an antibiotic. Now her she, right. her breath was kind of and the gum where the tooth <laughs> was located was inflamed, but the rest of the gum looked okay. Right. <laughs> But I gave the antibiotic and then the gum started looking much better again. Right. right. And then a breath cleared up. Yep. And uh, the, the, the real answer to that is that we describe that as pulse therapy. So if an animal had a cardiac condition, if an animal had cancer, then we would very likely use a week worth of antibiotic every month and repeat it. Now, the, the uh, immunologist and, and the infectious disease people say, you shouldn't be using antibiotics that way. All, all you're going to do is create a resistance. But on the other hand, if if that's the only alternative, I do it. And I, I do it probably once a month on a dog that either the risk of the anesthetic scares me uh, or the finances don't allow it. And it does keep the dog free of pain. But see, the, the real answer, does the tooth really need to be pulled? And that isn't determined until we take an x-ray which we can't do on an awake dog. So this one, the, I know this one will need to be pulled because it actually literally has a hole in it. It yeah. looks decayed. Yeah. We're not showing them. Well, it, it's, it's not really decay, but in, in greyhounds, they can wear or chip yeah. Yeah. Uh, or have enough tartar that the gum retracts and a double or triple rooted tooth, you can put a, a probe from one side to the other. So mm -hmm. cleaning that tooth is a joke because food and debris, hair, grass gets under the root and that is not a good situation and the teeth are so big in a greyhound that you could have half of the gum retracted off the root and it's still a heck of a job to get that thing out when, when louise would send me dogs their dogs we pulled every tooth at six years of age because there wasn't a tooth in the mouth that wasn't terribly infected with serious gum retraction well that was because at the track they would feed them and then they put their muzzle back on so they never got to chew on anything so they yeah. never they were never cleaned their teeth so um yeah it was like automatic decay well and i think there's eight or nine different factors that determine how much plaque and tartar builds up so see dogs don't have cavities they have a low ph in their mouth and very thick enamel but the chemical content of the saliva and how how calcium rich it is is part of it the bacteria that live in their mouth, all the little pockets and crevices, either between the teeth that may not be perfectly aligned or around the roots when they start to retract, how the dog plays with toys, oh. how they chew. And, and see, in the wild, if we see a, a, an outdoor cat, uh, or, or I've certainly taken care of uh, fox and those kinds of animals, always pristine teeth because they're killing and have to bite an animal 50 times, they're shearing, they're dismembering it, 
they're using every tooth in their head every day to obtain food and, and chew it. The commercial products we feed, feed them now, add a little water, microwave for five seconds, you could suck it through a straw. And, and, and they eat quickly. So tell me where the abrasive action occurs on right. the outside of the teeth. It doesn't. Mm. And, and, and their tongue uses the teeth like a picket fence to prehend food. But the entire upper arcade, the, the upper jaw, uh, is, is just prone to accumulating to, uh, a lot of tartar. Wow. Um, next topic. I mean, one thing that I was sort of curious about is um, if you have any suggestions about uh, greyhounds and heat, how to, uh, and any, any tips on like how to cool them off other than the obvious? Uh, yeah, one more thing I wanted to say about the teeth. Okay. If, after we clean teeth, there are water additives, typically chlorhexidine products that are equivalent to a good thorough scrubbing once, once a day. There are enzyme products that work if the teeth are clean and polished and the mechanics of taking a terry cloth rag or towel and literally wiping the upper arcade every evening it is an excellent thing. Brushing is not that effective. And for two reasons. One is that the, the, what we're doing, we're taking a brush and putting an antibacterial toothpaste on it and making a slurry to kill the bacteria. If we mechanically remove it with, so I think an old worn out beach towel torn into three inch squares is perfect. And you don't open the mouth. You literally make the dog smile and wipe up under the upper arcade completely. So you can hold the mouth shut while you're doing that. And especially if you're feeding them a toothpaste that's chicken or beef flavored, they think it's a treat. And so that's how we actually train them to do it. Feed them the treat off your finger for 10 days, start wiping a few teeth, then wipe all the teeth. And then ideally take that toothpaste and smear it on the tooth gum interface on the upper arcade. So you're taking every crack and crevice and filling it with a toothpaste that as it's put into solution uh, with saliva becomes a mouthwash. And th 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 that can't be done on a dirty tooth because the gum's lifted and food's already up underneath there. Philip, uh, we have a question from Philip Murphy or a couple of comments. Would you like to talk, Philip Murphy? Sure, no, um, first of all, thank you for the organ to the organizers and a special thanks to Dr. Poling. This is, you know, uh, just appreciate the, the time and energy that went into our being here today. So I wanna say thank you first. And um, yeah, yeah, no, when, when you were in Halston, we brought our hounds and we, we missed, we, we don't live there anymore and neither do you. So that's a tough one, we're in Pennsylvania, but um, just the, the details on the solution, cause I, I, someone else noted, also been brushing and that seems to be helpful although you're saying you that the wipe with a solution is better so the details on that so i can get them down or you know would be great well it, it, essentially you're making a slurry and the dog swallowing it and if you mechanically remove all that organic material your toothpaste when it's between cracks and crevices is going to be more efficient that mouth is going to be cleaner and have fewer bacteria for a longer period of time. Plus the other thing about uh, brushing, if the gum is good and tough, like when we floss properly, as opposed to when we don't floss properly, gum gets pretty tender. And that brush, if it's getting up in those spaces that are tender, you won't be able to do as good a job. And if, if that dog has been trained and acclimated to managing that cloth, you can be quite vigorous in scrubbing the tooth gum interface mechanically. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, take all that organic material out and the, the, what you can't, because we're not gonna floss, uh, can be killed by the residue of the bacteria or of the uh, antibacterial effect of, of the uh, toothpaste. And these toothpastes are made to be swallowed. So it's, it's quite different where we feel a grittiness and we brush and polish and rinse and spit that these things are literally made to be swallowed. So, so I'm clear, you're saying using one of the antibacterial toothpaste, but wiping instead of brushing, is that my capturing? Well, you, you could wipe with the toothpaste on your cloth, or you could mechanically scrub that tooth gum interface, the gums and the teeth as well as you can, then smear the toothpaste 
on the tooth gum interface and leave it. Oh, I see. So as, as the teeth you know, go from one to another, you're leaving a little, little sliver of that toothpaste between each tooth. Thank you. Quite welcome. If you like the chicken flavored toothpaste, uh, it's certainly not mint. Oh God. <laughs> okay. Any other tooth teeth questions before we? Move yeah, on? The, the the one on the heat period. Essentially, hysterectomy is the answer. What? I, I, well, no, no, the, the, I'm just talking about that kind of heat. Okay. Huh? No, no. Oh, no, well, heat, I'm radiant heat. Degree. Like I'm talking about, it's like 95 degrees out in in Texas. It's 105. Like, do you have any? Um, I always think about greyhounds as being particularly susceptible to heat, um, and it's it's just I don't. So I don't know. I mean, is there any any other suggestions you can think of to besides keeping them cool? Oh, that heat. That oh, okay. Kind of, yes, <laughs> All right. I was just going to spay the dog and get it over with. Oh well, no, but it's too late. It's too late. Sorry. Well, no, and in fact, I think greyhounds are heat tolerant. Really? And, and I say that because the surface area to, to mass ratio. So uh -huh. why do we have why do we have so many chihuahuas down here? It's the perfect know. dog for this environment. And, and why do we see the German he Shepherd, Rottweiler, Samoyed cross in the north? Because those are the dogs that can survive in that colder temperature. So short hair and thin body parts are much better for heat. Uh, oh, okay. removal. Now, that being said, how does a dog get rid of body heat? Mm. Two ways. They sweat from their nose and feet. Yeah, that's a big deal. 2% right. of their body. Right. And they breathe in cool air and oh. blow out hot air. And so the perfect temperature for most German Shepherd Golden Retriever type dogs would be 55 degrees at about 50% humidity. Now they're breathing in a differential of cool air and blowing out hot air at their body temperature, which is 101, 101, 5. When it's 70 and 80 and in an air-conditioned, 75, in an air-conditioned bedroom, dogs will wake up and pant. And if you got up and took a rectal temperature, they'd be 103, 2. Oh. So they just kick their panting mechanism and they may sit there for 15 or 20 minutes taking in that 75 degree air and blowing out 100 degree air. Wow. Now, yeah. how, how can we keep them from having heat stroke? Well, wet them down. And wetting the feet and the face is most efficient, but taking a plant sprayer and just misting them is very effective. And we've all been to the beach and, oh, what a beautiful day. And then we walk to the parking lot. My God, this is unbearable because there's, there's, there's no uh, evaporation going on. The other thing, though, is most of the hyperthermia that, that I've seen in greyhounds is related to anxiety and not environmental temperature. Mm. And have ever, any of you heard about this uh, hyperthermia syndrome in greyhounds? I, I think I've seen it half a dozen times. And so our policy is when a greyhound comes in the room, we take the temperature immediately. Oh. If, it's, if it's above 103.5, and it should be less than 102, we take it in three or four minutes again. And if it's elevating, we stop the exam, we use a intravenous sedative, a narcotic to relax them, and we start wetting them down. It was Sophie, uh, Sophie was one of those that overheated in your office. Yeah, and, and it scares the crap out of me. Yeah, she's one we, she's the crap one we, out of me. <laughs> Did, did, did we throw her in a snowbank or did we take her down and wet her down? Um, you gave her a couple of um, sedative, uh, sedatives yeah, to, yeah. to get her to settle down. And then, but on the way home, I ended up calling you on the way home because at the time I lived in Newton and I'm like, she's still completely wow. unhinged. <coughs> and, yeah, she, and, she, her, <coughs> and, you, and you just basically, uh, you know, said, that, you know, just to try to get her home, I got her home, and then she crashed for hours. Yeah. I mean, well, and, and the reason she crashed for hours, we used intravenous torbogesic, which is a very uh, powerful narcotic. But so I mean, it's, it relaxes the dog and, and lowers their blood, blood pressure, uh, and that's really the solution to it. I had two dogs, and the book says hyperthermia, anything above 105, and they're very likely to die from brain edema. 
I had two greyhounds go to 110, which is as high as the, the thermometer would register. Uh, but we had them in a kiddie pool. We were giving cold water enemas. We had two IVs running through cold water baths and l literally bathed those dogs for an hour until the temperature came down. And they both survived. Uh, but and that was for the anxiety? The anxiety? Yes, absolute anxiety. You, mm -hmm. And you can almost see it on their face that wow. they just have a panicked look. Mm. And uh, Dr. Kuto, I don't think he's published anything on it, but we talked about it. And he said he'd seen a dozen or so dogs over the years as well. And I've never seen it in another breed. Wowzie. And, and we see some anxious, dog, anxious dogs, you know, by the time we get the muzzle on and and, right, right, right. We, we, and we try, try to use drugs in advance that we describe as the chill protocol. Mm -hmm. But uh, even greyhounds on the chill protocol, which is a combination of ace promazine, which is a tranquilizer, and gabapentin, that's a, a nerve, it's used for nerve pain in people. We use it for behavior and either, either uh, seizure uh, augmentation wow. as well, as long with other anticonvulsants. Wow. Yes, it was. I have to say it was frightening. It was the second time. The first time Sophie uh, did it where she had injured her foot. Um, and yeah. this was, I don't know, in February or something. And she came in and she didn't see you. She saw another vet there in the hospital. And they took, they told me to take her outside because it was like 20 degrees outside. Yeah. And I had to take her outside for a while. And they said, walk her around before you bring her back. Yeah. And that was the first signal. Um, yeah. And then the next time she came in for her physical and saw you, that's when she just went completely. Now, if, if, if we know that dog has that degree of anxiety, we need to have drugs on hand before they come to the office and be prepared, you know, check that temperature. You, you can't wait until it's 105 or 106 to take action. It'll happen in two minutes. No, that's that's one of the I don't know how to... Does somebody want to say something, Holly? Um, no, sorry, I was talking to my husband. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, no, it just seems like greyhounds are definitely idiosyncratic. I mean, they have, um, and that's that's one of the things that, that makes it really important that they be treated by people who really do have an idea of what's going on with them. Um, yeah, I, see, I think the basic problem with them, many of them never had any degree of socialization that's normal. Right. And there's very critical periods of time with their interaction with their mother, with their litter mates, with strange dogs, with people. And these are extremely time sensitive. So if they don't have that socialization, like an institutionalized child, you can modify it, you can improve it, but it's always there. It's like, like a blank. Well, they just don't know how to adapt and right, adjust. Right, right, right. It's sort of like they're autistic or something. Uh, well, yes, in a way. Yeah. So, so they go from zero to, to sheer panic. Lousy. Hmm. Well, the funny part about it is, at least for Sophie, is that otherwise, I mean, she does it mostly she did it only at the vets. Otherwise, yep. she like loves everybody. She's afraid of, you know, not afraid of people. Yeah. Um, she's more of a people dog than she is a dog dog. Yeah. But she she's typically gotten along well with other dogs. But I mean, it was. It, well, it's, yeah, it's, and, and every time they come to see us, it's usually not a great experience. Right. It's, it's right, like it's right. like it's like me at the dentist. That mm -hmm. You're hypertensive. No, I'm trying to look like I'm under control and relax. But I don't really, really that was good. <laughs> uh, this is true. Um, okay, well, um, what other questions do we have? I have a question. Okay. We had a dog that was post anesthesia okay. and went into rhabdomyolysis which we were told was the, um, their body temperature went really high. Can you okay. talk about that? Well, see, I wonder if that's that anxiety syndrome and that rhabdomyosis, that, that, that's damage to muscle related to ridiculously high temperatures. Right. And it, it was traditionally described in workhorses that were overworked 
and especially if they had had a period of rest before they were worked. So they, they called it Monday morning syndrome, where they just worked those horses to death. They would literally pass myoglobin in the kidneys, have bloody urine, and have muscle wasting as a result of it. Now, why might a greyhound be predisposed to it? They're all muscle. Most of them have almost no body fat. So, and so big muscled performance animals are pr more prone to it. And if it was related to anesthesia, I, I wonder if during the recovery, uh, either the pain management or, or the, the preoperative drugs weren't quite right. And that dog had a very, very high temperature, which can do the same thing. Oh, he did, yeah. Yeah, uh, post-op, trembling, obvious pain, and uh, yeah, very high temp. By the time they got him to start treating him, it was at 106. Wow. Yeah, so that, that's near death. And, and the treatment is essentially intravenous fluids to flush the myoglobin out of the bloodstream because it has other negative effects. So, and, or even a surgery that... Uh, a repair of, of an orthopedic uh, fracture where there's been a lot of bruising and damage. See, I think those dogs have probably been set up for it because they have a lot of mechanical muscle damage before the anesthetic, before the panic attacks, uh, before the hyperthermia. Mm -hmm. They got two reasons. <clears throat> did you, did the dog pull through okay? No, we lost yeah. him. Oh no. He was 12, oh, he was 12. they tried for Gosh, I think it was three or four days, and yeah. it was oh, no. oh no, that's too bad. That's too bad. Oh. And the sad part was, it was just supposed to be a mild sedative oh, for yeah. something that wasn't even that critical. But we thought, well, let's go ahead and do it. And now oh. we're like, oh, we're not doing any anesthesia unless it's life or death. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah for sure. And, and that's that's what scares me though is these kinds of stories. And with my dog being ten and a half right mm -hmm. that's what right right after sophie had her first teeth pulled um in <coughs> march there was a dog um i saw it on facebook who went in for a dental i think at holliston that, and, that, and, was, that was the dog i was talking about that was, yeah and died yeah. yeah died and it died yeah. it died um out of a blood clot i think or something like that well yeah. no see see we, we were not using amino caproic acid at that point I mean, yeah. that, that's how we figured out something was wrong. It's like, this is not right. No, it was. But that was this year, Dr. Poling. Oh. I, it was this year. I, yeah. No, but, Dr., but Dr. Yeah. Poling wasn't there. Oh, no, no. He wasn't there. It wasn't. It wouldn't have happened with you. <laughs> well, well it, 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 thanks. But uh, see, we're just as panicked about the anesthetic as you are. And so all we can do is be diligent, have plenty of machines to monitor them have people that are paying attention, uh, work that dog up in advance and be as diligent as you can. But, I, and I don't disagree with you. If, if there is something that just doesn't feel right, then I would suggest that antibiotic in, in a repetitive pulsing kind of way. Uh, but I can have people tell you that's totally wrong, not the right way to do it. You're gonna create a resistant bacteria and uh, it's, it's not good practice. May I say something else about the anesthesia? When yeah. we had our greyhounds under, they were checking the potassium levels. And, and a couple of, there was a couple of instances where it got really high or low, I'm not sure which, and they actually stopped the procedure to make and, sure they were and, okay. And Dr. Kuto, Dr. Kuto uh, writes about that in one of his articles as well. And he doesn't know what's causing it. But, but his point is do a chemistry before and even do a potassium during the procedure if you have any question. Uh, high potassium can stop the heart. That might be a problem, right? So if, if you're, they're seeing arrhythmias, uh, most veterinarians should or could have equipment that can produce a potassium level in six minutes. And easy enough to do, inexpensive, and just do a potassium. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, uh, we make sure they do that whenever anything's done now, since that happened. Yeah. And, and, well, and the treatment for that would, would, could be corticosteroids. And uh, so that should absorb potassium or excrete potassium, retain sodium uh, through the kidney. So lots of fluids, intravenous corticosteroids, and stop the procedure.
Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Um. Julie. Okay, um, there was just something else in the chat. Somebody, I didn't get to see what it said. Ryan, did you see it? If you'll also see articles on the, the internet about uh, safety with induction drugs for greyhounds, and but, but they're related to the old uh, pentobarbital drugs that were used 30 and 40 years ago and no one should be using those drugs. They're still available, that uh, they are too long lasting, they're too fickle in, in uh, administration, and you can just kill dogs straight away with it. But they still sell it, some veterinarians use it. Uh, question, where does, uh, where does butorphanol, that's what got Sammy, the one that had the rhabdomyolysis, that's what they gave him, where does that fall in that spectrum? Well, that's actually, a, uh, I use torbegesic and, and not that drug, uh, because I think it's a little safer, but it's safer because I use it all the time and have comfort with it. But that is in one of the protocols in these balanced anesthesia protocols. And so they would start with a drug like atropine to keep the heart from slowing, a small amount of a tranquilizer just to relax the dog. Uh, and, and so you can use in less in induction drug. And the drug that's used most commonly now is propofol. And the reason it's extremely fast act, acting and very quickly eliminated from the body, three to four minutes. So as, as we give the propofol, we get the, inter, uh, the tracheal tube in, and then we're right on the gas anesthesia. Then we can manage it. Any of those injectable drugs, once you inject them, you're not getting them back. And if it's a relative overdose, a mistake, or, or that dog is especially sensitive, you know what it says on the label? Don't use this drug in dogs that have sensitivities. Yeah, well, that's mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah. That's a lawyer writing it. Well, too late now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but it, it shouldn't be one that, that, that at least has a history of creating problems. But, uh, well, you know, everyone's a unique individual. Right. Does everyone know about the physiologic differences of greyhounds about their their hematocrit their red cell count being extra high and oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah and Why see that's that's a gene genetic selection if you were an athlete and had a hematocrit of 62 percent you're probably red cell packing drawing your blood out spinning it down freezing it and before the big event uh giving yourself an auto transfusion <laughs> oh yeah the things do that <laughs> yeah the corners yep. do that yeah and then the uh, blood, blood urea nitrogen and more importantly, creatinine to poison levels, kidney poison levels uh, are probably 25% higher than most dogs. And I, I've been referred any number of greyhounds. Well, he's been treated for chronic kidney disease and it's perfectly normal for a greyhound. And, and the reason creatinine comes from muscle. Once again, these guys are muscle bound. So they just have more ability to create creatinine. It has nothing to do with their kidney function. Um, okay, it looks like Joanne has a question or a comment. Can you? Uh, do, do you hear us? We can't. Um, we know you can't see us for some reason, but can you hear us? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. What's your question? Um, you know we have an older greyhound, and we're wondering about using maybe a supplement that can help like sometimes her rear legs get shaky and i know that chondroitin is something we've used in the past but is there anything in particular that you recommend or that you think can be helpful uh yes uh glucosamine and chondroitin when that was first introduced they are sharp cartilage products or now there's a uh a, some sort of a mollusk kind of animal from Australia and their sources in green algae in the New Zealand, uh, Australia area. So the glucosamine chondroitin, those can help restore cartilage damage. And in school, we learned if you damage cartilage, it's, it scars and we call it fibrocartilage and the party's over. Now the cartilage can heal and there are things we used to scrape and do surgery on joints that would just use glucosamine and chondroitin. 
it increases the thickness, it increases the joint fluid, so there's more lubrication and protection. So it, it's a positive thing. And in fact, large breed uh, foods, starting puppy, adult, and senior foods have it in it for bigger breeds because they're prone to this. So mm -hmm. they're essentially saying the dog will be deficient in glucosamine and chondroitin, this protein combination at some point in life. So let's supplement it in advance. Well, and supplement it for a puppy. Are they prone to injury? Are they goofy and throw their body around like a maniac? So <laughs> they really do need these products because the early injuries lead to some of the things that we think are age related. Yeah, well, they started when they were had that first injury at six months. Then uh, the, the uh, three and six omega fatty acids, those have a tremendous non-pharmaceutical uh, anti-inflammatory effect. And many of those uh, senior products now have very large amounts. And, and the reason they do, first we used it for joints, then we used it for skin. Then the cardiologist said, use it. Now they're showing it can actually reverse something like 20% of the dementia we see in dogs that live long enough to have that. So it's a general anti-inflammatory that has no negatives, none, N no negative effects. Then so we that's can use the omega fatty acids you're talking about? Right. Okay, and, and this is something easily that we can get easily for the dog? Yes. Okay. They're, they're, if, if you look it up uh, and then you go to uh, GNC, Yep. They, will give, they will give you a combination that looks like it's, boy, way exceeded what, what uh, the dog would need. But they have very specific needs for more animal-based, and they can handle very few plant-based uh, omega fatty acid products. Mm -hmm. And there's actually two. It's EPA and DHA. Those are the two specific ones that dogs need. And the, the other problem with these uh, pharmaceuticals, when you buy them, they're nutraceuticals. So there's no government regulation on how they're produced, what, what the potency is, and, and, and the purity of the stuff. So there's one called uh, a company, uh, and the product's called Dasiquin. That was the first one that uh, guaranteed nutritional levels uh, that were pharmaceutical grade and consistent. There's, there's now a company that has the first study that actually shows performance enhancement using the traditional omegas and then using these uh, uh, kelp algae products. And the company's called You Move. And what they did, they looked at sheep dogs and how quick a dog could put 40 sheep in a pen. And they did it before and after. And their performance increased by about 10 to 20% after on the products for a couple of months. Wow. And they had more range of motion. So they were faster and had range of motion. Uh, but I, I think we see dogs that really do better and don't need the non steroidal anti inflammatories on those products, or they don't need them until they're 11, 12, or 13 when they got a bunch of other aches and pains. And see, they're, they're compatible then using them with uh, Remedil, Car, uh, Carprofen, uh, you know, all the non steroidal anti inflammatories that are out there. So how do we know how much of a dose? Uh, buy one of them, uh, either that uh, you move or the Dasik one, and it's got the right ratios and exact amounts. Okay, good. Yeah, and, but, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it, something that plagues her from time to time. And if we yeah. can make her more comfortable, mm -hmm. we will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have so I say there's, I have there's so no negative. It, it, it'll probably take somewhere around three to four weeks before you see a difference. But I think, and it's been proven in horses and dogs. Good. It's not, it's not Good. been proven in people, but I take it and I think it makes a difference. <laughs> your back legs are fine, right? I have what, so what's that? I said your back legs are fine, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I haven't been able to run 45 miles an hour. Yeah, Art wants uh, to uh, can run 45 miles an hour. Um, yeah. so Sophie takes Dasiquin, and they do have like the weight stuff on the back of the path package. Um, they want it has to build up in their system for like right. a month. So you have to like double the dosage every day for oh. a month, and then you go back to like just one a day. 
Yeah, okay. or there's a product called Adequin, which was the first one, uh, glucosamine chondroitin, and it was actually injected into the joints of horses, or we would inject dogs every other day for six treatments, and then they, they would literally have a loading dose, and we could go to the maintenance straight up front. Wow. And, yeah, and, and you would see dogs lame with no other drugs by the end of the six days, black and white difference. Wow. And, and, if you, and if you didn't double the dose in the beginning, it would just take two months to get there. So essentially what, what, what these guys are saying, those dogs are deficient in that. But if they were on a product that was in one of the large breed puppy and, and growth and, and uh, weight maintenance and senior diets, that you, you'd never have to add it as a supplement. It's there already. Yeah. So that, that's a cheaper way to do it too. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I'll look up those products and we'll start her on something. Yep. Well, well, make a difference. She's going to be here. <laughs> yeah. Well, or the other way to do it is, you know, to buy a food. Now, when you look at the amount in the food, it's half as much as the, uh, the, the, the pharmacologists tell us that the dog should have. But there's also a study that show one third of the prescriptions given never get given properly. Wow. So that dog eats twice a day, hmm. never misses a meal, never misses the glucosamine and chondroitin. And, and the nutritionists for the food companies say it works just as well as supplemental product. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it, it's not a negative to overdose it. You're just wasting money. Uh, so I'll use it with a dog that's on a senior product that already has it in it. Yeah, yeah. And, oh. and the companies that I would rely on, Purina, Science Diet, The Hills Company, and Royal Canin. Those are the only three companies uh, that have done original nutritional research. And actually, IMS, which is now a part of Royal Canin, they came out with that. And, and you can imagine the skepticism veterinarians saying, feeding shark cartilage to a dog is going to okay. solve this. But it, it's true. Yep. Well, I have to, so, like you said, Sophie's 10 and a half, but she's. She hasn't, she's really not running now. Um, and she hasn't been, I don't know, for two or three months, even on the Desiquin. I, I don't know if that's a joint issue for her because she does have arthritis or you diagnosed her with arthritis when yeah. she was, I don't know, six. Um, because she doesn't seem to be wobbly. She's not having any of that, those kind of issues. Um, but she just seems to be really, if she runs at all, it's for like a few seconds and then she's. Yeah. Well, and, and when you x-ray a racing greyhound, almost every part you, you x-ray, it's like, whoa, a little degenerative joint disease here, a little there, a lot here because there was a previous injury. Now, see, that's different than the glucosamine and chondroitin. That only affects cartilage and damaged cartilage. Now, that's a part of the degenerative process. But if you have a physical bone spur restricting range of motion, you just can't use that joint like you used to. Mm -hmm. Or if you do, it's sore and inflamed. So two things. Well, one is you could try one of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Rimadyl and keep her on a therapeutic uh, pretty much maximum dose for a week or 10 days. And if you can reduce the inflammation and she's much better, back it off. Does she remain functional and enthusiastic about running? But activity for an aged greyhound that's had injury should be thought more of like physical therapy and less like, oh, I'm going to beat my body in shape again because they're, they're damaged. Well, okay. isn't that also the case that they uh, it de would depend a lot on the racing life that the dog had? I mean, some of them are done it too, and that's great because then they got the rest of their life hardly any damage. But others have been racing until they're five. And it depends also, of course, on who had them and how hard they worked and how hard they raced. So yeah. Sophie ran 141 races. She retired at four and a half. So she had a long. Well, yeah, so yeah. She, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, damage. Um, yeah. so well, just wear, wear and tear, then the injury is inevitable. Okay. You, you see how they, they, they go around those corners there. They're angled at about a 45 degree angle and everyone's button heads and smashing each other into the rail and out to the outside, right? Free for all. It sounds like it's lucky that Sophie made out as well as she did. Yeah, well, but I see some dogs that have never raced that are in terrible shape too. 
That's why they never raced. Right? <laughs> they, they, they had injury straight up front. Well, that does it. Um, yeah. God. Um, anybody else who hasn't talked want to say anything? What about anybody else? Kathy? Lucy? Um, there's a question in the chat asking about <clears throat> um, someone's asking about a preferred medication for general anxiety or situational anxiety. They have a three-year-old anxious greyhound who suffers from separation anxiety and sound yeah. sensitivity like fireworks. Um, at the last resort, they gave him trazodone, like a small dose, when he's away from them or gabapentin during fireworks. Yep. Uh, there's, there's three drugs that are commonly used. The, the one that the people like for rescue dogs, the behaviorist, is trazodone. And, and I think the reason is this dog comes into a house, trazodone can act very quickly and doesn't take four to six weeks to build a consistent blood level. And those dogs need help right now or the owners are getting discouraged and the dog gets returned. But that there's dogs that don't respond well to trazodone, but they do to clomipramine or clomacom. And, and I, I think it's like you go to the psychiatrist and you explain your problem and they try a drug and they diagnose you if you're better on that drug. And, or if not, they change drugs or adjust the dose. Uh, so the, the common ones today, gabapentin, acepromazine, called the CHILL protocol for episodes. And that's very well defined. Tufts did a very thorough study. And then they, they can combine that gabapentin dose with the other drugs as well. Uh, there's, the dextomator is a sedation drug we use to even do minor surgery. And there's now an oral form of that specific for uh, thunder and fireworks. So, it, you know, it, it depends on the specifics of the problem. And a lot of times we look at it and say, this dog is anxious. Well, not really. He's fearful. Well, which, which is it? And we try a drug and see if it works. And then we switch if it doesn't. And what these drugs do, I think, they give the, the dog an opportunity to relax enough so they can actually learn. So it's not just giving the dog drugs, it's having a training program to build that dog's confidence. And I think the owner's confidence as well, that they're making progress with this problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Hi, this is Julia. And that was super helpful and actually kind of reinforces absolutely kind of, I, it, <laughs> I've had Nigel for a year and a half, he's three now and, the meds were an absolute last resort, but the separation anxiety was really the thing and it's kind of helped us with the training so much. So this is super helpful. Actually, all of this information is super helpful. So thank you yeah. so much, I appreciate it. Well, and, and what you need to determine, not what works for that dog, but what is that dog's problem and solution. And, and, and it's much the owner being sensitive and, and being very receptive to what works and then what works, go for it. And, uh, and I think many of these dogs can develop a relationship with one person and then maybe another dog in that house actually helps. So there's just a hundred ways to approach it. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Joanne, did you want to say something? Uh, no, we were just saying, no, we're not getting another dog. <laughs> No. Your hand is Dr. Poling, did you want to tell anybody about Bonnie and what we've discovered? Uh, we, we actually covered it before I think you came on. Oh, yeah. Sorry, we were late. I'm She's sorry. She's the star of the day. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry we don't have the photo because she's here with us lounging. Yep. So, and she's doing great. It's, it's just a nice surprise, is what it is. Yeah, you're right. And right. always, you know, don't, I mean, not that you shouldn't amputate or whatever, but we didn't do it with our last Greyhound. We chose not to, and it was the right thing. And we chose not to with her. And you may want to make sure you're getting, um, you know, the aspirations or you're getting other tests. Don't just jump to, you know, to amputate or do chemo without me, you know, just being sure. Yeah. I went to a conference and I, and, the guy was showing x-rays and said, we amputate the next day and start the chemo that evening. Oh, And, and, and uh, when, when <laughs> I spoke to Dr. Kuto about it, he said, really? 
that sounds like a malpractice suit waiting to happen. Yeah, now, yeah. what Dr. Kuto does, he uses a large bore needle, yep. literally an in intravenous needle, and sticks it three or four places. Two reasons. One is many times you miss the primary area of the cancer and you get what's called reactive new bone. Now, that's what I think your dog had on the x-ray is reactive new bone. Yep. So you, you want three or four sites so that you just get a, a positive diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the what we call tree finds, which are kind of uh, big, very large instruments and take a big piece of bone. Not only can you miss it, but you can break the leg with it. Oh. And so that, that's the other reason. Uh, well, it, it, you're damn sure it's got cancer if you break the leg with, with the biopsy. But yeah. you, know, yeah. you, don't want, you don't want that to happen because that's extremely painful as you can no, imagine. No, yeah. No, we just, we just no felt lucky. I mean, I, it just was one of those things. You said you looked at the first x-ray and thought it was cancer. Dr. Kuto looked at it the first time in September, said the yeah. same thing, but yeah. we decided to just do palliative care and day by day, she just was the same. So. Yeah. Well, is that one of those faith healing things? <laughs> no, I think the biologic variation of animals and people yeah. it isn't yeah. always as it seems. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, a lot of times it is. We had, it was cancer with Rolo, but, you know, yeah. we're just lucky it wasn't. And thankfully, you took a good look and, you know, figured out what was going on. So we're grateful. Yeah. That's a good story you like to tell again and again. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> that's, that's one of the... the top of the hip parade that's for sure uh, yeah well that begs, that begs the question are you dr polling are you do you have a an email address or a phone number if we have a question or want to have a yeah. consultation sure. or? it's it's rodney w polling at hotmail.com okay great and so you, you you can send copies of uh, lab work or x-rays and i'll be happy to take a look at them yeah, so it's and, polling and, with one l it is, yeah, R-O-D-N-E-Y-W-P-O-L-I-N-G. Rodney, uh, Rodney dot W dot. No, no, no Rodney W okay. polling, no dots, no caps. Okay. At hotmail.com. Oh, awesome, it's great. It, it, you know, I haven't examined the animal, but when I do see those things, just having that greyhound experience, it's uh, what about this? What about that? What about this? And I'd be also happy to uh, share what I know with the other veterinarians. I mean, that's, how did I learn? That Dr. Kuto gave me his personal phone number. And, and every time I called, I'd say, I, I got to pay you for this consult because we've been on the phone for 30 minutes. No, 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 go take care of greyhounds. Oh. So uh, I got to pass that along because he gave it to me. Well, but you also learn from the decades and decades and decades. Yeah, I, I hate to make the same mistake twice. It, it kills me. Oh, yeah. you don't, but you don't make the same. You know. no, no, I make new ones. You make new ones. Well, <laughs> that's good. I mean, that's at least you learn the new things. Well, how, how do you like Austin? And how uh, did you end up down in Austin? <laughs> Well, but my son was here and he wanted to build a big boarding kennel training grooming area. So we, we bought seven and a half acres and have a pet lifestyle campus here. And I, I'm going to be taking a partner on, but there's so few veterinarians out there. They, they're, so, so I came down for six months, build the vet clinic, and then I just started working. And that's been a year ago. So I, my, my goal is to work one month, take one month off and yeah. never quit. But yeah. wouldn't it be fun looking forward to vacation, looking forward to coming back to work? Yeah. Perfect. Luck. <laughs> well, they're lucky to have you. What about the lady that works? And it's, I, I definitely, I think, like New England better. Oh. And I like going to the rodeo. I like the, the, uh, the plants. They're different. Uh, but I think I'm a little more New England than uh, Texas. Yeah, I think you are, too. Um, yeah. Do you, you think that you'll ever come back up here or in, well, it would depend on COVID, of course. Uh, but like, you remember, we used to have like in-person Q&As with you. Um, maybe we could do that in an outdoor place or something like that. But I guess that's all conjecture at this point. Uh, COVID is going to end. Uh, you think I mean, so? I, I, well, 
Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think I think it'll it'll go away. Yeah. Unless we have more and more and more mutants. But we will. We will. Well, what about all those poor greyhounds that are being boiled to death in the meat markets of China? That's where yeah. COVID's from. Yeah. We can't so, solve that problem. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can. Of course, we can. We have to try to do that. One uh, of the things we put. One of the things that I put in the around in the chat was uh, the business card I have that has the email addresses of all the groups that I still work with all over the world. No, we no, we have to stop that because. Uh, I mean, it's horrendous that, you know, greyhounds are sold. They go from Ireland to, uh, to the meat markets in China. I mean, it's, it's just horrendous. Um, one of the things that I have been trying to do lately, just as an update, is uh, get the Irish more interested in uh, sending their extra dogs here one way or the other, um, instead of sending it to China, um, that I went to uh, the, um, the British consulate had a... Uh, a web, a, a, a actually sort of a meet and greet with uh, the guy who's the minister of the, fine, the foreign affairs minister from Ireland the other day. So he was here. So um, I went, he was on the 35th floor of the Bank of America building. But uh, he was really interested when I started talking to him about how the Irish could have a very positive new product. All those greyhounds that they've got. Um, and so, you know, he seemed like a dog lover and there were other people in the room who thought that it was a good idea. So it would be, I mean, they've got like lots and lots of greyhounds and uh, they've got the supply and we've got the demand. We just have to figure out the logistics and making it so that the, uh, um, you know, the transport doesn't cost so much and the regulations aren't as hard as, as they are. But and Dr. <laughs> Dr. Kuto, he thought, well, certainly the, the, the lurchers are healthier dogs. They don't have any of these issues. Right, no, they don't. They're more genetically diverse. And, and even the Irish dogs, he thought right. were in general healthier than the American. They ones. are, they are. They have different <laughs> different, uh, different DNA sorts of things. And the other place that I've been working with uh, is uh, Argentina, that uh, there's a young man who has a, a shelter there that we've been, I've been helping him. But uh, a lot of uh, the Florida dogs, the Florida greyhounds, they got on the they got on the plane in uh, Miami and they got off of Buenos Aires, um, and it, it's been downhill all the way. Um, so there's there's lots of international work still to be done. And even now here, um, I mean, you're right, the lurchers are still here, and uh, the greyhounds that we have. Well, isn't it true though? The more tracks that are closed, the less we're going to have here anyway. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that all it means is that they. There's less. There's no racing here, but it's it's been right. it's been transferred to yeah. China, to Spain, to Pakistan. Right. It's really big in all those countries. There's no animal welfare regulation at all. So um, eventually, I would think all the dogs are going to end up coming from overseas anyway. Well, they will, but I mean, in the meantime, they'll if they're unless there's a global resistance to what's happening to them, yeah. then they'll be killed by the the thousands. And I do think that. Uh, oh. The COVID isn't going to go away as long as, you know, greyhounds are being boiled with bats. I mean, it's it's a, it's a, a, the, a source of uh, contagion. Yeah. Ask Mariah, who who has COVID now. Um, Mariah, who's uh, a great uh, tech person, who who just got COVID a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Um, so anyway, um, that's. Uh, Another aspect. What? Um, any other questions for this time around? Um, and you know, I think if we're going to plan another one of these, what I would like to do is have people submit the topics in advance, so oh, that, 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 so that I could do a little research, make sure yeah. I'm current. And uh, and maybe move the speech and, and presentation along a little quicker because uh -huh. okay. that makes everything sense. organized. Okay, I'll uh, I'll talk to Mariah and uh, everybody else. Um, and uh, we we have recorded this, so um, we'll be, have that posted at some point sooner than later. Uh, and, what will that be posted, Louise? Uh, well, as soon as Mariah gets better. And um, Mariah, who has COVID, 
who's the person who usually does all that? She does the recording and she does the um, posting. I'd say, I'd say in about like a week or two. Okay, the sooner the, yeah, it was soon as you can, Mariah. Uh, no, it sorry. wasn't when, it was where, where. where? Um, it, yeah, it will be on YouTube. And um, if you want to friend Louise on Facebook, um, we'll post it on her Facebook. Yeah, and, and I can also email it to you. Um, now, is there a YouTube channel that's affiliated? Whose YouTube channel? Out of here, you know, I'm just trying to pin it down. Um, I think it's just for this. For this, um, I think it's the it's the Boston Boy um, YouTube oh, yeah. channel. I can put a link in the chat. Just give me a minute. Oh, yeah, thank you, Mariah. Uh, thank you very much. Mariah, you want to put the link in for the book as well? I mean, if people wanted to, um, they could find out some more about Boston Boy Great Hunter. Um, that uh, Dr. Poling's um, featured in for sure. Great. Well, we will we will have another. Uh, we'll figure out the, the timing, and we'll definitely uh, continue to have things more organized. Thank you. I learned something new every time. Thank you so much. Oh, good. You're good. welcome. Thanks. Great. Um, advance. Wonderful. Thanks again to the organizers and to Dr. Pauling, especially. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes, you. thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Um, and any questions that uh, I can help with? Um, Louise Coleman, 10 at AOL.com. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Good evening. Bye. -bye. Say hi to your dogs. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.